Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharon Neville, the Operations Director for Criminalistics within New South Wales Health Pathologies Forensic and Analytical Science Service. I'm really pleased to be here with you today, chairing this, our final plenary session for this year's forum. This afternoon's plenary speaker, Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, is the president and founder of Identifiers International. Colleen is an internationally recognized forensic genealogist, an absolute pioneer in the development of forensic genetic genealogy for solving violent crime and unknown person cold cases, sometimes decades old. As the co-founder of the DNA Doe Project, which ran between 2017 and 2020, Dr. Fitzpatrick led the team that solved the first two cold cases using genetic genealogy. And this was before the highly publicized Golden State Killer was identified using similar methods, resulting in widespread media attention. Dr. Fitzpatrick has appeared in hundreds of newspaper and newspapers and magazines, on international radio and television programs, and is a popular guest on podcasts. She is the author of three hobby books, Forensic Genealogy, DNA and Ge Genealogy, and The Dead Horse Investigation, Forensic Photo Analysis for Everyone. Dr. Fitzpatrick has been invited to speak for both genealogical and scientific organizations in the US, Canada, Europe, Australia and New Zealand. In both police and forensic agencies around Australia, including here in New South Wales, there is a high level of interest in exploiting the capabilities of forensic genetic genealogy. So this is without doubt something you are going to hear more about in the future. I am extremely honoured to introduce to you Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, who is speaking to us today from California and who will explain to us how this investigative tool enables forensic identifications that would otherwise be beyond our reach. So welcome, Colleen. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. And um, I'm going to share my screen and talk to you for the next 45 minutes or so about the revolution in human identification called forensic genetic genealogy. I think it's an honor to be asked to speak to you today. Um, I'm the president of Identifinders International, as Sharon said, and thank you for inviting me. I start my talks uh, usually with a collage of these of people who have benefited from the revolution. These are people whose cases have been solved after so many years. They are uh, both victims of violent crime and uh, otherwise unidentified John and Jane Doe's. There are a couple of identity frauds as well. But what I haven't included is the families of these people who have been brought answers after decades. And I and it's not possible to include other people that won't be victims and won't be John and Jane Doe's because their perps, their killers, have been taken off the streets. So, you know, I want to emphasize that this is why we're doing what we're doing. You know, it's not the commercial, it's not the, you know, the fame or the glory, it, it's all victim centered. This is why we do what we do. The outline of my talk is very simple. I'm gonna tell you how it happened, how FGG came about. I'm gonna explain the difference between CODIS and FGG. And my understanding is you, you call it something different. You call it PP21 in Australia. I'm gonna explain a little bit about how it works and then I'm gonna give you some case studies and a cookbook. I call April the 25th, 2018, the beginning of the Oh My God era. And that is when Joe D'Angelo was identified as the Golden State Killer. But, uh, you know, this was, I call it the Oh My God era because it's like, oh my God, how did they do that? Oh my God, oh my God, can I solve this case? Can I solve that case? It was very exciting. But what, what people don't realize is this was based on 20 years of prior art that led up to that day. And it went like this. In about 2000, there were several entrepreneurs that founded several companies that realized that uh, genealogists could use DNA to find their long lost relatives in the absence of documentation. Uh, the first products offered were YSTR tests, 
And the reason is that the Y chromosome follows the, the male line of the family, like the family name. And what do genealogists study? They, we study our family names. So offering Y test, uh, you know, uh, offered a new way of finding those, you know, doing family research that couldn't be done before. This became very popular, especially among a male adoptees who didn't know who their birth father's name was, because if they got a match to somebody in the database by a certain name, such as Fitzpatrick, they could be reasonably sure that that was their father's bi biological father's last name. In 2005, I published a book called Forensic Genealogy. It was a hobby book. It was meant to, to tell, you know, apply very simple scientific principles to genealogical puzzles, like how to identify old photographs, but it really took off. But more importantly, it coined the term forensic genealogy in a way that didn't go away. In 2006, 23andMe was founded to offer a, a different kind of testing. They didn't offer STR testing or YSTR testing. They offered something called autosomal SNP testing that, that involved a different kind of marker called a SNP. And SNPs appear all over the genome, so both men and women could uh, use this kind of testing. 23andMe founded it for medical reasons. They were doing something called genome-wide association studies, looking for markers that were related to various diseases, not genes, but just markers that were associated with those genes. But soon, it, genealogists realized that it had a, a use for genealogy, and so that was a second way that started to develop in 2006 using DNA. In 2011, back to YSTRs, I had an idea. I went to the Seattle Police Department and I had the idea that if they gave me a Y DNA profile, I could compare it to the genetic genealogy databases and come up with a last name for their killer. Because, you know, it didn't matter if the person who gave you that Y profile was a violent offender, he was a John or Jane Doe, or he was an adoptee. You still didn't know who that DNA belonged to, so it didn't make any difference. Well, when I went to that meeting in 2011, I was almost laughed out of the room. The detectives didn't understand what I was talking about. However, there was a woman in the room called Jody Sass. She was a DNA analyst with the uh, Washington State Crime Lab, and she understood what I was saying, and she offered to connect me with the detectives working on a certain case. She didn't really tell me the details if they came back the next time they came back to her because they kept coming back to find out if there was anything new they could do. And that's what happened. They connected me to, to the King County Sheriff's Office. She connected me to the King County Sheriff's Office and I became involved in the Sarah Yarborough homicide, which was the murder of an, uh, in 1991 of a high school student, um, a high school student at the, at the high school campus one Saturday morning. Um, they, uh, we, comparing the Y profile on the case to the genetic genealogy databases yielded the name Fuller, and the Fuller genealogist that I was matching came down from Robert Fuller, who lived in Massachusetts in the 1600s. He was related to the Fullers on the Mayflower. So we got into this weird situation where we had the killer's possible last name and his genealogy going back to the 1600s, but we didn't know who he was. Now it's a different. It's another story for another time. I could give you a long, uh, you know, description of what happened. It's very interesting. In the end, we solved it in 2019 with the SNP testing, and it turned out the guy's name was Nicholas, not Fuller, because his grandfather was adopted. In 2015, I continue. Of course, I continued going to various police departments with my idea, and in 2015, I happened to speak to the Phoenix police department. I was in the city for a, a conference. So I went over there and I told them my, about my idea on how to pre, how to compare the Y DNA profile uh, on, a, on a case to, on a cold case, to the genetic genealogy Y DNA profiles that were public and online. And they took me up on the offer. And, you know, short time later, I got a call. I came up with the name Miller and um, that the rest is history. They were able to narrow down the suspects from 2000 to just five. And of those five, Brian Patrick Miller's DNA matched the crime scene DNA and the rest is history. That was the first case solved using FGG. 
2017, as Sharon said, uh, I was a co-founder of the DNA Doe Project that we we uh, founded it for 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 using SNP testing for identifying John and Jane Doe's. Now, at that time, uh, going back, switching again to SNP testing, 23andMe was still around, Ancestry was still around. Uh, there was Family Tree DNA, DNA Heritage. There were several companies doing this SNP testing, this different kind of testing. As I said, men and women could both take it. And uh, we, we were asking ourselves, gee, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, the, the adoptees are using this these services to find their birth parents. In fact, it was so effective that around 2017, if you were an adoptee, it was a 50, better 50-50 chance that you're going to find your birth family using this technique. So we said, why can't we do John and Jane Doe's? We didn't want to do violent offenders at the time because we were afraid that that would scare everybody and that they would pull away those databases, in which case nobody could do anything. So we, we focus on John and Jane Doe's and the direct-to-consumer companies like Ancestry refused to work on forensic cases. So we developed a workaround using private labs and GEDmatch, an open source database, to do our work. And so that's we went from there. And in 2018, exactly one year to the day later, we made our first success story. It was the identification of a man named Joseph Newton Chandler III. That's what they thought his name was. He committed suicide outside of Cleveland in 2002. Um, but when he died and the authorities tried to uh, contact his family, they found out that that wasn't his name, that his uh, Joseph Newton Chandler III was actually a nine-year-old boy that was killed in a car accident outside of Dallas in 1945. The U.S. Marshal from Northern Ohio had hired me to find the last name using Y-DNA, and I came up with the name Nichols or Nicholas. And so fast forward, he was agreeable for us using this idea we had to try and identify Mr. Chandler, which we did about a year later. Um, his name was Robert Ivan Nichols, and he and I got the name right, I, Robert Ivan Nichols, and he was from Indiana. In 2018, about two, two weeks later, two, three weeks later, we did our second identification of Buckskin Girl. She was a girl who was about 20 years old that was basically a body dump outside of Dayton, Ohio. Um, this was, I think, a 27-year-old case, and we solved it in four hours. That was the second success story. And, of course, you know, the Golden State Killer was identified shortly after that on April the 25th, 2018. And as I said, the rest is history. So that's the backstory of how we got to where we're going, where we are today. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about the difference between CODIS and FGG. Now, I know that we have a variety of people in the audience listening and a variety of levels of experience and knowledge, but uh, it doesn't matter to have a, a review if you need it. I, so when, you, when, you, when we use CODIS, which you call PP21, I believe, um, the, everybody is familiar with the pipeline. Basically, you review the evidence, you send the DNA to the lab, the lab creates a profile, you upload to the database, and you search for hits. Everybody's familiar with that. With FGG, what you do <clears throat> is you review the evidence, you send the DNA to the lab, you create a profile, you upload to the database, and you search for hits. The pipeline is generically the same. The difference is that you use a different lab, different profile, a different kind of database, and a different kind of hit. So in the old days, if you were used to calling the lab saying, hey, uh, have you created a profile? Have you uploaded it? Are there any hits? You can still do the same thing. You're just going to get a slightly different answer. CODIS, uh, as you may know, uses autosomal STRs. And these are, uh, these are called short tandem repeats. The key word is short, which means short and long and short and long and short and long. It means it has some length. Um, and these are, you can call them 20 pieces of well-characterized real estate. And they're scattered all over the chromosomes, as you see in the picture. And they're used for match or exclusion only. You can have familial searching, which means a, a partial match is available. But basically, it's very limited to, you know, I'd say, just say match and exclusion. So when you look at FGG profiles, that we use a different kind of marker called SNPs. 
and SNPs, autosomal SNPs, the fancy name is single nucleotide polymorphisms. But just remember what the S stands for, and that means single. It doesn't mean short. It doesn't mean a piece of something. It means a point of something. So when we do FGG, we use 1.2 million points scattered all over the, the DNA. And this brings about a new way of looking at things because now we can discuss how many of the points, how much DNA you share with somebody else. The more points you share, the more DNA you share, the closer you are related. And the fewer points you share, the more distantly you're related. And this brings up the subject of relationship estimates. So using FGG, you can use, you can produce relationship, and that brings up the idea of genealogy. So to sum, CODIS versus STRs. CODIS uses 20 STRs, I mean, CODIS versus SNP testing. CODIS uses 20 STRs, SNP testing uses 1.2 million SNPs. CODIS is a match or exclusion only technology, but SNP testing, uh, it, it produces relationship estimates and you are able to use those to build a family tree of your John or Jane Doe. Now, because you're have you starting to involve uh, relatives to some degree, you can look at those relatives and deduce ethnicity or geography, geographic info, family history, even you know, if the if the uh, unknown person is is Jewish. I had a case one time that was the oldest case in Orange County from 1968, a Jane Doe. And uh, I got involved, and when we opened the database to look, open GEDmatch to see the matches, I immediately knew she was from Maine. And they asked me how I knew that, and I said, because all of her matches are from Maine. And she was from Maine. That was the beginning of her identification. CODIS is used for legal identification. SNP testing is only used for generating leads. CODIS is immediate relatives. As I said, it's very, very limited. With familial search and you do partial matches, it will, it will get into the immediate relative zone. But with SNP testing, fifth cousins are more distant. I've solved cases with eight to 10th cousins. So that's basically the difference between CODIS and FGG. It's different kinds of markers, basically. And, and those markers allow you to do different things. But this is how FGG works. Let's talk about FGG a minute. Well, we're really not talking about FGG. We're really talking about data. My background is that I have a doctorate in nuclear physics. And people ask me how I got into genealogy. In the old days, I would look at graphs like this with little squiggly lines. And today, I look at things like this. So the thing is, the, the common thread here is data. You know, uh, if you look at cars, you look at people, you look at houses, they all generically have stuff in common. Well, so does data. And one of the interesting things about data and which makes it very hard to deal with is that most data is not useful. So how do you make sense? You know, like in the old days when I looked at the squiggly lines, you know, I may only like that peak with the blue box pointing to it. You know, maybe that and the rest I have to throw out. Well, in genealogical terms, there's a lot of data there. How do I find the important stuff that I really can use? When you uh, upload, one of our databases is called GEDmatch. When you upload your, their, your profile to GEDmatch and you look for hits, you look for matches, you are presented with a screen that looks something like this. You have the kit number, that is the ID number. You have the name of the match. You have the email for the match. And you have how much DNA they share with you. Now, the whole point of all these you know, people on your list that are all, we call them DNA cousins or relatives, is that you want to join them into some kind of relationship network. You want to build their family trees and see where they connect together in the most recent common ancestors. So how do you do that? You know, you, these are four matches on the list and they have trees. So what do you do? Well, each one of those matches has a family tree. This is Patrick. He's got parents, grandparents, great grands, so on to great, great, great grandparents. So when we're working this, we have more than just Patrick. We may have 10, 20, 30, 100 matches. 
how do we find how Patrick is connected with the rest of the matches? How do we do that? Well, we that's that's where our tools come in. You know, we have ways to to look at the data and find those sweet spots, find those commonalities. For example, find people that all came from the same place, you know, geographically speaking. Find people that are, you know, have the same last name. That's another thing we look for. Uh, find people that are related to each other. So, you know, we have a lot of tools we can use on that. And here are three tools that I will tell you about. We, we First one is an admixture tool. When you upload your data, there's a place you can click, and it will give you a pie that looks like this. And what, what, the, what the tool does is take your SNPs in your, your data set, and it will compare them to various scientific databases uh, that contain information on ethnicities. So the pie here looks like it's half a red pie because the red stands for um, the British Isles, the North Atlantic region of Europe. That is British Isles, Southern Scandinavia, Western France. Um, and it's not unusual that whoever uh, it, this is the profile for would be uh, highly, would have a large section of red because the genealogical databases are, are skewed toward Caucasian Europeans because in the it's a United, it's an American phenomenon and the databases are built by you know uh, just European Amer European uh, Americans of European origin who have discretionary funds to take these DNA tests. The orange is uh, continental Europe, which is the Baltic countries, Eastern Euro Europe, and you know Eastern France. Uh, Germany and on, and the and the other little flecks of color in this particular pie, are are just various Mediterranean areas and East Asian areas, West Asian areas, because over time, of course, there's been migration. So this admixture tool, the the example I'm using, is a Caucasian, typical Caucasian European admixture. Then we have something called DNA painter because, you know, as I said, the number of SNPs you share, the amount of DNA you share is has to be translated into an es a relationship estimate for us to be useful in genealogy. So DNA painter does this. It has, uh, you basically, it, it makes it really easy. You can put the number, in this case, 342.5 units, I'll explain that later, units of DNA, and it will produce a, you know, a chart like this that is a certain percentage first cousin, a certain percentage aunt or uncle or great aunt or grandma, because DNA is inherited statistically. So it may be that a first cousin may share the same amount of DNA as an aunt. And so, you know, you have to realize there's, there's a distribution of relationships, but the tool helps you narrow down what that could be. The last tool, which we probably won't talk too much about, is uh, called the A matrix or the autosomal matrix. And what this does is show you how the matches relate to each other, which ones that do relate and how closely they're related and which ones don't relate. And so you don't have to bother trying to connect them. And this is useful because as I said, you're trying to build a network of, of relationships, a network of people who are related to each other and to your un unidentified person. I want to present, you know, a cookbook and show you kind of generically how we do this. You first, you find out everything you can about your matches. You find out, you know, uh, basically how old they are is very important. Uh, where they live geographically, if you can find out their parents' names, if they have brothers, sisters, you know, that kind of thing. Their address, uh, if they have a Facebook page. And secondly, you take those people and you start building their family trees. And basically, mostly, you start with the top matches first. And as you do this, all the matches are related to your unknown person. So they, in some sense, they are related to each other. So as you start building these trees, you're going to start to see they're going to start to connect to each other. And in an ideal case, you're going to farm Two, two groups, you're going to form one group intermarried, interconnected with each other, and the other group interconnected with each other, but the two groups won't connect. And these are groups, ideally, that represent the two parents. In that case, you take one, you find one person in one group who has married a person in the other group, and that's going to be their parents. 
and one of their children is the person you're looking for. Now that person, that child is related to both of those parents, related to both of those groups and all the matches that the groups have been founded on. And so that's the basic cookbook of how we do our work. And in graphic terms, you start with a lot of matches, you take the top matches, you try and find out you know, how they're related to each other, they will form two groups that are not related to each other. You find one person that's re that's in one group, married one person in the other group, and one of their children is who you're looking for. So I'm going to, I guess I just uh, showed you the cookbook. Now I'm going to show you the case studies. I have three case studies in mind. Case study number one was Buckskin Girl. She was a Jane Doe found uh, in April uh, 1981 outside of Troy, Ohio. She was a body dump. I mentioned her earlier as the second case ever solved. She died by strangulation. Her feet were clean. She was a body dump. She was not a sex worker. She had good hygiene. She uh, was out in the middle of nowhere in a field and her feet were clean. So they knew it was a body dump. Well, that different people in town had met her during the day, had actually spoken to her uh, the day, that day or the day before, but nobody knew who she was. And she got her name because she wore a buckskin jacket. So there was nothing they can do in uh, 1981 except, you know, bury her and, you know, put something in the newspaper and hope that somebody, you know, checked the local missing persons reports and there was nothing that could be done. So we got involved. Well, excuse me, in 2016, what, something else happened first. And the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children sponsored pollen and isotope analysis to see if they could find her geographical range. And this gal had been traveling quite a bit. She, The pollen in, in her jacket uh, was representative of the Southwest United States, like in Arizona, New Mexico. She also had some soot in her jacket that's from the, the evergreen area around like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, industrialized area, colder area. The isotope analysis uh, on her bones and her hair showed she had been in the Fort Worth area and within twice within the month before she died. So this gal was really traveling all over the place. The National Center also produced this new um this new uh, facial reconstruction from the original autopsy photos you know thinking that well modern modern facial reconstruction would be better than what was done in the 1980s nothing could be done the girl was buried in um in troy in the cemetery and that was it until we got involved so we we did you know what i said we made the the snip data we sent it to our private lab. They made the data for us. We uploaded it to GEDmatch, and this was her ethnicity report. And as I said, this is a typical Caucasian European ethnicity report for which we are very grateful because, you know, if she was African American, it would be a lot harder. Uh, you know, Native Americans are very difficult because they don't take DNA tests and because their family structure is so much different than ours. You see the, the red uh, sector, she's mainly uh, British Isles. She has a nice orange piece of pie there, which means continental Europe. So about three quarters, um, you know, con uh, North Atlantic or continental Europe with those splashes of Mediterranean. She does have a pink uh, to the right, a pink wedge, and that is African-American. So somewhere in her line, she was her family intermarried with African-Americans. So when our top when our top matches came up, it looked like this. As I said, there's uh, you know the total amount. It's a slightly different layout, but it's the same thing. You see the autosomal, you see X DNA, how much DNA she shares that all of these matches share with our Jane Doe, the name and the email address. Well, when we looked at this, the top match was a woman. Her nickname was Sam, and we had her email address, and so we investigated Sam. She shared 415.4 units, or we call them centimorgans, with our Jane Doe. So the question is, what, what does that mean? What is 415 centimorgans? What does that mean? What is the relationship estimate to our Jane Doe? Well, that's where DNA Painter comes in. 
you pop that number into the painter and it tells you that there's almost an 80% chance she's one of these relationships. Now, Sam was about 20 years older than Buckskin Girl would have been. So therefore, they, we have to eliminate great, great aunts, great aunts, stuff like that. I always eliminate the greats to begin with. And we're left with two possibilities, a half first cousin or first cousin once removed. You hear the word first cousin and you understand that it's going to be a close relationship. We were very excited about this possibility. So what is a half first cousin? Let's see if Sam and Buckskin Girl could be half first cousins. A half first cousin, there's Sam, there's her parents, there's her grandparents, when you have a half first cousin, what that means is grandpa has two grannies. It could be grandma with two grampies, but in this example, I'm going to use grandpa and his two grannies. He has children by both marriages, and those are half siblings. I'm sure you all are familiar with half siblings. And when the half siblings have children, they are half first cousins. So the key to checking out if Buckskin Girl could be uh, Sam's half first cousin is to find out if grandpa or grandma, if one of the grandparents married more than once. So we spent some time on looking at Sam's grandparents. We found her family tree on ancestry. We researched this and we could find no evidence that grandpa was married or grandma was married more than once. So we said half first cousins is probably out of the question. Now, if we find there's an illegitimate child, grandpa had an affair with somebody else, you know, it happens, we can always back up. But for the time being, we ruled out half first cousins. What about first cousins once removed? Again, this is how this goes. This is Sam, her parents. Now, we're going to go up mom's side for the sake of time. But we did mom and dad's side. We did all the grandparents, all the possible combinations of what I'm going to show you. That's the parents, that's the grandparents on mom's side. So, you know, first cousins share grandparents. Think about that. Think about your first cousins, and you will understand that you and your first cousin share grandparents. So let's come down. Uh, grandma and grandpa had, you know, three, four, what, four daughters, one son. We came down the son. Okay, the son, and this is Sam's first cousins. Remember, they share grandparents. And uh, Sam had a first cousin named John Sosaman. John Sosaman, we looked at all the first cousins. Let's talk about this particular one for a minute because he had six children. He was married twice. He had six children. We were able to find five of those on Facebook pretty quickly. And these would be first cousin once removed because when the first cousin has a child, that's a first cousin one generation below which is once removed. And remember, we know Sam is about 20 years older than Buckskin Girl. So if you look at this and you look at the generations, it makes sense that Sam is one generation older than uh, John Sosaman's children. We found five very quickly. The sixth child, we couldn't find any mention of. And when we looked on Ancestry, we did find her profile on Ancestry under the name Marshall Lenore King Sosaman. Uh, born in 1959 in uh, Mississippi, uh, missing, uh, death, dead, missing, presumed dead. Now, you can't get anything better than this. When we saw this, we went crazy. And it turned out that this information actually came from John Sosaman. He was the family genealogist, and he had posted it on Ancestry as a kind of note in a bottle, you know, to, to tell people, you know, what happened to my daughter, I really missing, assumed dead. So, that took about four hours. We immediately notified the Miami County Sheriff's Office and the name is case manager that we thought we had made the identification. We always notify the agency and let them take it from there. They notified, they called uh, Buckskin Girl's father, John Sosaman, unfortunately had died two or three months earlier. He just missed us and never knowing that we found his daughter. So the Miami County Sheriff's Office called Buckskin Girl, Marsha's mother, who lived in Little Rock, Arkansas. Actually, they called Marsha's uh, brother, or I think they called the nephew. The, the, and the nephew informed his grandmother, who would be Buckskin Girl's mother, about what happened. They didn't want to call her directly because she was 80 years old and she was not well. So uh, the mother uh, was uh, overwhelmed because she had refused to move 
for 37 years. She refused to change her phone number because she was still waiting for her daughter to come home. Her daughter uh, hitchhiked all over. Her daughter would, you know, had medication she was taking. And when she didn't take the medication, she'd leave home and wouldn't come back for a long time. And then the mother was still waiting 37 years later. This is a picture of Marsha Sosaman King, uh, you know, that the mother gave us. And that's the the photo, the rendition that the National Center of Missing Exploited Children developed out of the autopsy photos. So Buckskin Girl, the name is, was, the case was closed and uh, taken away from NamUs, and she was finally buried under her own name. And what else can you expect? The second study I'll tell you about is, the, is this one is not a Doe case, it's a homicide case. This is the homicide of Julie Hansen in Naperville, Illinois, in 1972. Uh, Julie Hansen borrowed a bicycle from her brother to go just for a bike ride, maybe to a, a summer baseball game, who knows, and she never came home. Two days later, they found her murdered in a cornfield. She had been stabbed 36 times, and she had been raped post-mortem and then redressed. So, of course, in 1972, there was very little you can do except canvas the neighborhood and hope for luck. And, of course, nothing happened. They just, you know, not, it went nowhere. So we got involved in 2020. And when we got involved, you have to understand, we're dealing with 50-year-old DNA now, and there was, wasn't a whole lot left. Um, when we do a case, the amount of DNA we hope for is one nanogram of DNA. We hope for a degradation index of between 1 and 10. And this is the number of small pieces of DNA divided by the number of big pieces of DNA to make it simple. And so we're looking for how degraded, how much DNA we have and how degraded it is. So we were presented with two different samples. The first one was a sperm fraction from the semen on her body. It was one third of what we hoped for and the degradation index was unmeasurable, meaning that it was fragmented. You know, that the DNA was in itsy bitsy pieces. It, it just, it was in terrible condition. The second sample, the epithelial frac fraction, was probably a mixture of Julie Hansen and the killer, which means that we only had about a tenth of this amount of DNA we hoped for, and not all of that is gonna be the killers. The degradation index was much better than the other sample. So we thought about this and we said, basically we have just an, a little bit of very bad DNA. So what can we do with that? Well, sample number one, the sperm fraction, if you look at that and you think about it, first of all, it's a single source sample. It's, it's, no, it's not a mixture, so it's all ours to use. A uh, higher amount, okay, that's three times the amount of the other sample, even though it's very small amount. The degradation is extremely bad. It's unmeasurable. But SNPs are really small markers. Remember I told you that a minute ago? They're just points. So you could put a whole bunch of SNPs on a little teeny piece of DNA, and that might work. So SNP testing might do better with this, this sample, the sperm fraction, uh, because maybe the degradation really doesn't matter that much. Now, when you look at sample number two with the epithelial cells, the DNA was a mixture of male and female. Okay, so not all of that 115 picograms is going to be your, your male. Um, so that's already a handicap. But the good news is that you can use it for YSTRs, because when you have a sexual assault, you're going to have a mixture of male and female DNA, and the, but yet you can pull the Y DNA out and maybe I could do the name search and try and get the name for the killer. So we came to the conclusion that maybe this epithelial fraction was better for the Y STRs and the sperm fraction was better for the SNPs. So this is, we, we decided to send the sperm fraction to the lab to make the SNP data. Now I wanna make you understand that this was a Hail Mary play this is it. If we can't make it work, we'll never identify her killer. And this is what happened. Late November, uh, we had initial discussion on the samples, you know, which one we're going to use, you know, all the debate I just told you about. We came up with using the sperm fraction.
And about a week later, there was an agreement that, you know, we go ahead and send it out to the lab. Um, the lab, uh, you know, shipped it, uh, Naperville, the crime lab, shipped it out about a month later. And then it took a while, because we're in the middle of COVID now, and it took a while. The labs were half-staffed. So it took three, three months for the lab to complete the sequencing. Now, when we do sequencing, we're actually making an electronic copy of the whole genome. All the DNA is there is going to be recorded in electronic format but we don't need all of the data. We just need those 1.2 million SNPs. So we have somebody come in with bioinformatics software to pick out just the SNPs we need. And the guy that did it uh, did two GEDmatch kits because when you start picking out SNPs, you can decide which SNPs, let's say the confidence levels become important. If you're sure the SNP is really there, you take it but yet you can reduce the confidence level and take SNPs that mm, maybe aren't quite as uh, confident. So he produced two kits, one higher confidence with less data and one with less confidence and more data. I hope that makes sense. We had two shots at this. So we took the higher confidence data and the kit would not upload to GEDmatch because it was too degraded and it couldn't pass the filters on GEDmatch. GEDmatch has filters that prevent junk data from getting into the system. We asked the owners of GEDmatch to please run some diagnostics to see if there was anything they could do to help us improve the data. And they came back and said the data was worthless. So we had one more shot. We had that kit number two with the lesser uh, confident data to upload to Jedi, and it uploaded. It must have barely uploaded, and we solved the case in two hours. Can you believe that? I wish this would always happen. How did we do it? Well, the top match was a man named William H., and he was born in Wisconsin in 1943. And as I said, you have a number, 73 centimorgans. We put it in the calculator, and it told us that the man was second to fourth cousins to Julie Hansen's killer. So to work that, our genealogists just started building. Remember, the, you identify the person and you start building their tree. All right. So she started building the tree. There's his parents, there's his grandparents, and there's his great-grandparents. Now, she went to great-grands because that's the connection of a second cousin. First cousins are grandparents. The connection with second cousins is great-grandparents. And then she started filling in the tree coming down. So these are, you know, grandma and grandma. It turns out, let's see, this is grandma's two sisters. And I'll call your attention to Florence. Let's put Florence, let's give me some real estate here to work with. Florence was married to a man named Leo Barry. And they had four daughters and one son. Now, we're just filling out the tree at this point. You know, we haven't found connections. We haven't really done too much. We're just sort of those first few minutes where you're just sort of throwing things together. And uh, in, in investigating the, the family here, I'll draw your attention to Grace Barry, daughter Grace, who married Herman Welpley. Well, it was interesting because this whole family was from Wisconsin. And it turned out that during those six months, while we're processing the DNA to the lab and the bioinformatics and making all these decisions about the sperm fraction versus the epithelial fraction, Grace died. This is her obituary. So Grace died two months before we're ready to go and read her obituary. It says, Grace Welpley passed peacefully into the arms of her Lord in January 2021, joining her husband, Herman Welpley, and her son, Douglas Welpley, for a long-anticipated round of golf. Naperville residents for many years. Naperville residents. How about that? Of this whole family, there was only one couple who lived in Naperville, Illinois, and that was Grace and her son. So we went back to the tree, and Grace had three children. She had a daughter who could not be the perpetrator. They And her her, other, her son, Douglas, was a doctor. I think he lived in Chicago, and he was already deceased. He was just not in the area at the time. The only one left was their son, um, Barry Lee Welpley. Um, 
and the police uh, collect. He lived. He lived five minutes away from Julie at the time of the murder. And there he is. His DNA matched crime scene DNA, and he's been. He used to live in Minnesota. He's been extradited to Illinois, and they're they're you know discussing on how to how to um, bring him to trial. We did a sanity check. You know, you just can't say, hey, I found it. We have to confirm. So here's Barry Lee Welpley. And remember, William H. Let me put him back in the picture there. And if we're right, he's got to be a second to fourth cousin. They have to be second to fourth cousins. And as I said, you see, they're connected to their great grandparents. And that is, in fact, the connection of second cousins. So we did more than William H. We also looked at several other matches, and it's all consistent. So we turned over that investigative lead on Barry Lee Welpley, and he was arrested, and he's been extradited to Illinois. The third case is uh, the, the Bibb County John Doe. This was a teenager who was hitchhiking near Pratt's Ferry Bridge over the Cahaba River in Alabama. For those of you in the audience, let me remind you where Alabama is located. And he was pretty much in the heart of Alabama. He stated to the driver he was going to California to join the Marines. I mean, they just had small talk. And unfortunately, shortly after that, the car, car hit a guardrail, went into the river. He broke his neck and he drowned. There was a few things on his body that really didn't help identify him. A watch, a pack of cigarettes. Um, he had a picture of a girl, his girlfriend, and it, he had actually carved in his arm something that said R-Y plus love. And, but that none of that really tells you who he is. Of course, they did the best they could to get the word out to see if anybody uh, identified the, the boy, but it didn't work. And they put, a, you know, a news story, of course. And the part of that is very touching. It said that they talked about the snapshot he had of uh, with his girlfriend. And there was an inscription that said, think of me always and remember how we used to go places together. But of course, that was it. That was nothing could be done in 61 except bury him. And that was the end of the story until the power of modern technology kicked in. In 2016, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children sponsored an exhumation of the boy. They, they uh, kept, they took three teeth and a partial tibia bone from his remains and they sent it to the University of North Texas for extraction. Now the, the, the remains were so old that the extraction yielded absolutely nothing. However, we came into play and we said, it's been five years. DNA extraction has advanced. So we, we took it over and we had the coroner send the tooth, a, a tooth root and that tibia bone to an ancient DNA lab for analysis. In other words, we were using the same extraction as they use for um, mummies. The results were spectacular. As I told you, we need one nanogram to work. We had almost 46 nanograms of DNA. For us, that is almost like a 55 gallon drum of DNA for us to work with. That came from the tooth root. The left tibia produced five and a half nanograms. So that's a lot to work with. The DNA in May uh, of 2021, a couple of months later, we sent the extract uh, to the lab to do the SNP testing, SNP analysis. We did the bioinformatics, and a few months later, again, we're coming out of COVID, so things are moving slowly. The data was ready. We uploaded it to GEDmatch, and our John Doe was identified as 15-year-old Danny Armentrout. Danny was the youngest of three brothers, David, Donald, and Danny. The, the mother, their mother had remarried. The original name was, uh, was Armentrout. She married a man named Hamilton. And the, the stepfather was extremely abusive. He burned the kids with cigarettes. He screamed at them. He hit them with belts. Um, and the mother said she wished that he had never been born. So the middle brother, Donald, joined the military in 1960. Um, he had to get out, and he went into, I think he joined the Marines. Um, when he came home for Christmas in 1960, both brothers were there. They celebrated Christmas together. But then uh, when he came back in 61, neither brother was there. Both had run away. So Donald had spent 
years, decades, trying to find out what he happened to his two brothers. Now, he expected to find uh, his older brother, David, because David had a social security number. But he never, the last we've been able to trace David was in Florida in 1963. Otherwise, nothing. He never dreamed he'd be reunited with his brother, Danny. So last year uh, in December, there was a memorial service between Christmas and New Year in, in Centerville, Alabama. This is our genealogist, Misty Gillis, who solved the case, uh, or actually identified Danny, and I should say handed it to the coroner to certify that it was him, confirm it was him. Um, they had a, uh, they wanted to bury him under his own name. So the family came out. Here is Donald, his brother, and Tara, the wife. Donald's now in his 80s. They came down for the uh, ceremony. And it was also the, the man on the left is the, is the mayor of Centerville and the woman on the right. Then you see Donald, you see Misty, you see Tara, and you see the woman on the right is the state representative. And, you know, this, and of course, you know, this is what why we do what we do. So in summary, this is why we do what we do. It's the only reason we do what we do. Thank you for listening. I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you, Colleen. That was absolutely fascinating and it really demonstrated what a powerful tool forensic genetic genealogy is. You use the expression, oh my God, but I think we're still feeling that, oh my God. There's quite a few questions coming through and we don't have very much time, so I'll just see if I can run through them. Um, first of all, somebody has asked, do the public genealogy databases still use YSTRs or have they migrated to using SNPs exclusively? Um, it's both. They're both. They're different databases. The SNPs are GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA, and that's the autosomal. That and, and you can upload your your data from Ancestry. You know, can you? You actually wait. We don't work with Ancestry, Twenty Three Me, etc. But you can download your data from those web those uh, companies and upload it to GEDmatch. Uh, but we don't. We don't use. It. You can do that with MyHeritage data. We don't work with MyHeritage. Family Tree is the only direct-to-consumer company you can work with directly. You can get yourself into directly. Anyway, um, the, the YSTRs were different. They are different uh, scattered websites all over the web. We have a Fitzpatrick study. They usually keyed off of the last name, but they can be keyed off a certain nationality, like there's a big Polish study, for example, a big Irish study. So it, they use both. The, the tendency is to use SNPs more uh, because it's so powerful, but I still do quite a few Y-DNA cases because with Y-DNA, you don't have to send DNA out. You know, the genealogy and the uh, and the law enforcement uses the same markers, so they can send me a PDF of the results and I can do my work. Um, so that's still there, especially in cases where you don't have any more DNA to do the SNP testing. Mm -hmm. Is there mitochondrial databases available as well? There are, but they're not useful because mitochondrial goes along the female line and the name changes in all the generations. And also mito really uh, mutates so slow that you can match someone on mito and be related 2,000 years ago. Um, somebody has asked, uh, can you share any amount of SNPs with profiles that are non-relatives? Uh, yes, you can. And that is called identical by state. Like if you look at mine and you look at those distant relatives, I'm probably related to most of Ireland. You know, I look at very distant matches and we share it's called because we come from the same gene pool. This is very common among Jewish people because they've been intermarrying for a long time. And, you know, everybody's related to everybody else really distantly, at least distantly. Yes. And it's just you're you're really so distant that you say you're really not related, but you're from the same gene pool. Um, and the next question is, how do you find out where the matches are from for forensic genetic genealogy? I think that well, was you, in your talk. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm saying you, the name is given to you and also the email address. So you can, uh, you a lot of those people have built their family trees on Ancestry, on Wikitree. You know, they're out there. Some people are on Facebook. You can search by the email address. There are a few that are very difficult to find, but not that many. You know, we can pretty much 
figure out most of who the people are. And um, this topic comes up quite a lot, Colleen. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. Do you see any ethical concerns around using FGG for solving criminal cases? Um, there's a big discussion in order to keep things private. We don't release the names of matches. Um, I, I don't really see that much. I mean, you should protect people's privacy. It's always a discussion between uh, privacy and public safety. You know, you always have to navigate that. I myself don't see that, you know, I, I, the only thing I see is that some, if you originally do the whole genome sequencing, which, you know, eventually comes to the data, that captures everything, including medical data. But we don't use that. We, you know, we throw the rest of it away. And um, I really don't see that much as long as you keep the people private. And I, I just might ask you, uh, Colleen, around um, an Australian case that there was quite a bit of media uh, interest in, and it was a unknown deceased found in 1948 on Somerton Beach in South Australia. And I believe you may have had some involvement in that case. Is there any um, comment yeah. you could make? I think it might be leading to an identification after 70 years. Yeah, that was very interesting. That was a Somerton man, and I worked with Derek Abbott on that. He's a professor at Adelaide University. And it was very interesting because Derek had some hair that had been saved from the man in 1948 when they did a 49, when they did a plaster cast of his body. They, uh, in, in you know, before they buried him, they, they um, you know, they did the plaster cast and some hair got caught in it. So uh, it was in a museum and about 10 years ago, he was allowed to have some of the hair and he actually got, a, a, an, a, it was like a hair expert, I forgot who it was, that actually went in with tweezers to pull the hair from the inside of the bundles so that he had hair that wasn't exposed to the plaster for 75 years. Um, so uh, we use that hair, now you can get DNA from hair, and we got the SNP data from hair, and that's what we used to do the genealogy. Uh, there was there were very few matches that were useful because this is Australia, not the United States. But the top match was a young man named Jack. And it was interesting because when I was building Jack's uh, DNA family tree out, you know, start trying to connect him with other people, it turned out his great great grandparents were Thomas Keene and Frieda Webb. And Keene was a name of items in the man's suitcase when he, that was found in the train station. So the minute I saw the name Keen, I knew we were on the right track. And it turned out to be Frieda Webb's brother. It's a very interesting case and really good work to get that from a hair. We find hair samples very challenging ourselves. Yeah. Um, Another question coming through saying, is there a particular case that is proving difficult or is a thorn in your side? Um, yes, there is. Uh, and it's called uh, Baby Madison. It's a, a case of a little girl in Madisonville, Texas. It was found in a suitcase a few years ago. Um, and she had a feeding tube in the suitcase. And she was had been there for several months. Uh, the the problem is she's probably from Central America. We did isotope analysis on her teeth. We've done, are we doing that right now? We've uh, found out she's part Texican Mexican. She's part uh, California old Hispanic. She's part Central American. She's part actually French Canadian. You wouldn't believe that, but she is. And so we have done all the genealogy. We're doing isotope analysis. We have contacted various um, Let's say we got her uh, profile in Interpol. We, we've contacted several uh, agencies or organizations in Central America that deal with disappeared people and with um, also that work with uh, children that have been trafficked. So we're trying to, uh, you know, coordinate with them to see if her DNA maybe matches. And we have names of people in Central America, in El Salvador and Guatemala, that are her relatives, that might be her great, great grandmother. But because the, 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 the records are so few and far between for Central America, it's hard to build that genealogy down. But we, that's another reason we're cooperating with these organizations, because they can go to that door, they can go to that cemetery and get, you know, look at the death registers that we can access and try and help us build those trees down to find out who she is. I'm sure you'll solve that, Colleen. You'll keep going. I hope so. Get there. 
You will. <laughs> Can I just ask too, you mentioned about the database has been skewed towards Caucasian uh, populations. Do you see that as a significant limitation or, and, and do you see that changing in the future or will it sort of continue to be skewed in that direction? Um, I, it, it's a challenge, let's put it this way. It's not a showstopper. We've solved African-American cases. We've solved some Native American. They're harder. Um, and I think it will change because uh, I know that, for example, there's a big project called the Tulsa Race Massacre that they're working on trying to identify some of the unidentified dead from the riot in 1921. And for that, they're calling on a call to action to the African-American community mm -hmm. to get tested, to try and help these victims of this riot long ago. So I think that as time goes on, it will get better, but I think it will always be a challenge. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, I think we may have run out of time for questions now. Um, Colleen, I can't thank you enough for sharing that presentation with us. It was extremely interesting and we'll all be following different cases as they um, come to resolutions in the future. So thank you very much. And I think you did put your email on the last slide of your presentation. People, if you're happy for people maybe to reach out to you yeah. with questions they might may like to ask you as we run out yeah. of time so yes. um so thank you very much colleen and i'm just might remind everyone to jump on to the next link for our closing address to the uh, forum